Sure. Okay, so um, good morning, everyone. On uh, behalf of the BIDMC Women's Cardiology Leadership Development Group, it's my great pleasure to introduce our Grand Rounds speaker for today, Dr. Minow Walsh, who's gonna be presenting our annual Women's Cardiovascular Disease Lecture. Dr. Walsh is um, an advanced heart failure and transplant cardiologist. She's the medical director of the Heart Failure and Cardiac Transplantation Programs at Ascension St. Vincent Heart Center and the St. Vincent Cardiovascular Research Institute in Indianapolis. She's also the program director of their Advanced Heart Failure and Transplantation Fellowship and leads the Heart Failure Service Line. Her areas of expertise include uh, nuclear cardiology and advanced heart failure. And she has a special interest in cardiovascular disease in women and also in patient-centered healthcare. So I had the opportunity to work briefly with Dr. Walsh on a statement for the American College of Cardiology, which was a real honor because this is an organization that she has been active in throughout her career, um, including serving on multiple committees and working groups and chairing committees and working groups, as well as serving as the national president of the ACC in 2017 to 2018. And her impact has really been far reaching from her editorial positions on numerous journals. She's the deputy editor of Jack Case Reports, the section editor for the Journal of Cardiac Failure, um, and a reviewer for multiple, multiple other journals, as well as the author of more than 200 articles and book chapters. She's led numerous clinical trials, and, and importantly, she's also taught and mentored trainees in all stages of their careers. So in these roles and others, she's really been a fierce champion for women in cardiology, um, working to ensure that women's voices are heard, whether as patients or as trainees and colleagues building careers in cardiology. And so we thought that it was very appropriate to have her speak today where we wanna highlight um, some of these themes and, and the focus on patients and also women's career development. So thank you for joining us, Dr. Walsh. It's really an honor to have you here and um, the stage or Zoom is all yours. <laughs> thank you. Wow, Shweta, what a great introduction. Very kind of you, thank you. Um, I'm really happy to be with you this morning. I do wish it was in person, but um, of course uh, the, the pandemic has a different choice. Um, what I would like to talk about is uh, something that's really uh, very dear to me, which is shared decision-making in cardiovascular medicine. Uh, different from most of the lectures I give around heart failure and, and other uh, clinical areas, but this is really an important um, area for all of us to think about in cardiovascular medicine. I'm gonna talk about both practice and policy implications, and then I, I really do look forward to um, discussion at the end. So these are, just to remind you, these are the Institute of Medicine core principles. Um, healthcare that is safe, effective, patient-centered, timely, and efficient. And I wanna focus today on patient-centered care. So we in cardiovascular medicine know all about disease-centered care. In fact, we have more guidelines than any other specialty. So we're very good at focusing on the disease and knowing what uh, diagnostic and therapeutic choices we have and how we should use those. But contrast with uh, disease-centered care with uh, goal-oriented care or outcomes. So this is a, a great paper by um, David Rubin and um, Mary Tonetti from several years ago in the New England Journal. And it shows a comparison of traditional disease specific and then and goal oriented outcomes. So if you look on the left in the measurement domain, survival is a traditional outcome. It certainly is for all of our uh, trials in cardiovascular disease, but it's not really a goal oriented outcome unless the, the patient or the person um, does not value survival as a high priority goal, such as, for example, surviving to, to a personal milestone. Biomarkers, which is the second me measurement domain, are never a goal-oriented outcome. Um, the, they're traditional, though. And then signs and symptoms and functional status can be both a traditional outcome 
an endpoint for a trial, for example, New York Heart Association functional class, six minute walk testing. But these are really tied into our goal oriented outcomes as well, because patients have a measurement of how they feel. So why patient-centered care? Patient-centered care compared to um, usual care has been shown to improve outcomes and quality of life, increase adherence to medication and improve chronic disease control. And th the third uh, uh, bullet or line here, I think is really important to address racial, ethnic and socioeconomic disparities in care and outcomes. Very clearly patient-centered care compared to usual care can make a difference um, when we're looking at um, equity. And then also reduce overuse of diagnostic testing in some procedures. And I'm gonna show you some data on that, on how patient-centered care can address the issues of overuse in medicine. Why else? Well, reimbursement and, and incentives are now and will in the future be tied to this. Um, and I'm gonna give you some examples, some really up-to-date and current examples of that, but there are many um, policy efforts, including patient-centered care elements, and that's value-based purchasing, the national quality strategy, meaningful use, patient-centered medical home, et cetera. You see them all listed here. The Affordable Care Act does address patient-centered care, and we'll discuss that. I wanna show you a um, ACC policy statement that um, I had the privilege of chairing with uh, Fred Bove in 2012. And the college decided at that time under Dr. Bove's leadership, he was president at the time, that we really should have a policy statement, put our toe in the water as, a, as an organization, as a membership organization and say, we believe that this is important. And what was, uh, I think, extremely important about this policy statement was it, the two uh, authors that you see that I've um, highlighted here our patients. And it was the first document that the college uh, put out that included patients as authors. That has um, changed. Uh, there are other guideline statements uh, and many other papers um, that are including the patient voice, not just in, um, the, in ACC, but, but many others um, who are um, doing guideline papers, et cetera, are including the patient voice. So, what am I talking about when I'm talking about patient-centered care? The elements of patient-centered care are listed here. Enhanced communication between us, the clinicians and the patient. Health literacy, an examination of health literacy so that we know that we're communicating well with our patient. Uh, patient education is important. Collaborative care planning and goal setting is important. And then patient empowerment and self-management. But what I've highlighted in green is shared decision-making. And I wanna focus on that um, for the rest of the time. Um, this is again from the New England Journal from several years ago. Um, Dr. Dr. Barry said in this um, viewpoint, one of the most important attributes of patient-centered care is the active engagement of patients when healthcare decisions must be made. These decisions, this is not every decision that sh should encompass shared decision-making, but decisions that where there's a diverging path and that have very different and important consequences with lasting implications, one decision versus the next. Examples are decisions around major surgery, medications that one might take for the rest of one's life, and really importantly, screening and diagnostic tests that can trigger a, a whole cascade of um, other interventions that might follow. Shared decision-making is not the same as informed consent. Many of you might be saying, well, we already do this. We, you know, we don't do a procedure on a patient who we don't you know, have uh, informed consent in the cath lab, the EP lab, et cetera. But informed consent focuses on risks and benefits. And yes, we do that. We're, we're careful to do that. But when, you're doing shared decision-making with a patient, what you're doing is eliciting their, that patient's values and preferences. And I want you to come away from this, this morning better understanding that our values and preferences are very different. Each of us have different values and preferences. So when we talk about doing shared decision-making, 
I like this sort of diagram to show us the respective roles that we and the patient play in negotiating a decision. So if you look on the top, surgery for an intracranial hemorrhage is very clinician driven. We do not go, the neurosurgeon doesn't go to the emergency department and, and in, engage the patient and the family in shared decision-making. They, they, there's a catastrophic event, surgical um, surgery is recommended and, and there's not a lot of values and preferences. But Cosmetic surgery, on the other hand, is very patient-driven. Um, and then with regard to our field, DAP, dual antiplatelet therapy after DES, uh, pretty clinician-driven, although in, a, in an elective case, we would talk to the patient and, and, and elicit what other things might be going on so that we know that no, further, no other surgeries or procedures are going to be needed in the near future. But then statin now or three months after trial of uh, diet for primary prevention would be really patient driven. Uh, I hope some of you are on Twitter. I put this in because first of all, it's an information highway and uh, I learn a lot uh, from reading uh, outside my area. And I, I, put, I tweeted this several years ago because uh, JAMA Oncology uh, had a paper that showed that um, there was no improvement in quality of life with palliative, palliative chemotherapy. And I, I wondered, and I put the hashtag shared decision-making, I just wondered how much oncologists were, are sharing this with patients with these given diseases. So this would be an example of some really important data to use in shared decision-making if you are an oncologist with a patient with uh, the condition studied. Um, I don't know if any of you know who Emily Oster is, but I um, love this uh, paper that she wrote in 2013 in the Atlantic uh, while she was pregnant. She's an economist and she wrote a paper about thinking about pregnancy like an economist. She, she later turned it into this book that's called Expecting Better. And she said, in, in the Atlantic article, she said, uh, what I needed to sort through in the valuable and useless information on alcohol, prenatal testing and deli meats for myself. So what does this have to do with shared decision-making? She's a microeconomist. And she said in the Atlantic piece, microeconomics is the science of making decisions, a way to structure your thinking so you make good choices. And making good decisions in life and in business requires two things, the right data and the right way to weigh the pluses and minuses of a decision personally. That is values and preferences. So she also said the key is that even with the same data, the second part, the weighing of the pluses and minuses may result in different decisions for different people because individuals have different values. So she took pregnancy as an example and said, those of you who may have uh, been pregnant <laughs> or are pregnant, uh, she said, pregnancy medical care is, seems like a list of rules. You could only have two cups of coffee a day. The guidelines say you should have an amniocentesis only if you're over 35. One or two drinks a week is probably fine. And she said, what about preferences? Um, so, and again, there's this is a little bit of a data-free zone, as you, as you all know, about coffee, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so preferences and values are important. This is an example of a decision aid. If we're going to do shared decision-making with our patients, decision aids can be very valuable in, in the decisions. And I'm showing you a decision aid that's outside our field completely. So let's all decide, let's all pretend right now that, that we're facing a decision around a herniated disc. And the decision is, should I have surgery? And this is a, a decision aid you can download off the internet. So you have, so the decision in front of you, have surgery or don't have surgery. A decision aid first gives you information. Number two, compares the two options. Number three, where it says your feelings, that's the eliciting of your values and preferences. And then you make a decision and then you're quizzed on your decision in, that, in a way that you can uh, sort of reaffirm that yes, that, that is my decision. And then you have a summary and a decision aid like this could be 
printed off and, and then taken to the office visit with your surgeon to, that you're gonna have with the surgeon so that you can discuss it. So decision aids can be used in the presence of clinicians and they can be used independently um, by people and patients who are making decisions so that they have time um, to think of, uh, do the, sh do the, use the decision aid outside the clinical realm. Here's an example in, in cardiovascular medicine. This was published in 2016. These investigators used a decision aid in the emergency department to um, engage patients with low risk chest pain. These were not patients with end stemmies or stemmies, low risk chest pain after they'd had their cardiac testing, including ECG and, and biomarkers. So they used this decision aid, which in this case was a pictograph that shows um, the three little red figures you see. That you can sh see how they showed the patients how many people with the type of symptoms the patients had uh, would do poorly. And the question was, do you want to be admitted to an observation unit in the ED for cardiac stress testing the next day or follow up in the next 24 to 72 hours with a cardiologist? And here's what they found. This is the management and 30 day outcomes. And they uh, overall, they had a decreased rate of admission for advanced cardiac testing and stress testing within 30 days of the ED visit. And uh, there was no uh, major uh, adverse outcomes. So that's amazing uh, because they use shared decision-making to actually decrease utility of testing and hospitalization or, or overnight stays without any bad outcomes. Well, back in the day, at least when I was in medical school, you had to have surgery if you had appendicitis, well, not any longer. For both children and adults, uh, for those of you who follow the surgery literature, antibiotics are often um, considered. So this is a decision aid in, that was used in the emergency department by these um, investigators to help parents decide between antibiotics and surgery in uncomplicated appendicitis. And they went through this decision aid um, while their child was in the emergency department. And this was loaded onto an iPad. So here, that's another example in the surgical literature. Um, another uh, study that was in the Annals of Internal Medicine a few years ago um, used an iPad decision aid in the waiting room of primary care practices, and it focused on colorectal cancer screening. And patients were, they used the decision aid and actually made a determination of what cancer screening they preferred, whether it was colonoscopy or whether or not it was, you know, the equivalent of Cologuard, that type of uh, testing. And uh, also amazing in this paper with this iPad, once they went through the, used the decision aid, they actually ordered their own test uh, afterward. So very innovative. So let's talk a little bit on about the impact on care and cost if we use shared decision-making. And there's several um, papers that I wanna highlight um, there that you can uh, see the references down below. Um, as many as 20% of patients who participate in shared decision-making choose less invasive surgical options and more conservative treatment than those who don't use decision aids. And if we think about how much cost savings that would be, um, the Lewin Group uh, in 2008 estimated that implementing shared decision-making for just 11 procedures would yield more than $9 billion in savings nationally over 10 years. And there was a study by Group Health in Washington State uh, that demonstrated that using decision aids with patients who are eligible for joint replacement, hip and knee, substantially reduced surgery rates and costs. So some of you might be saying, well, why would the surgeons want to do this? Or if there are any of the surgeons are, are on this morning. Um, that's a big concern, actually, because it's clear that with SDM tools, uh, elective surgery volume does decrease. But, but what happened, what is the impact on care? If we look at a Cochrane review of multiple studies involving decision aids, we find that patients have increased knowledge. Kind of shockingly, patients don't really understand the decision that's facing them sometimes. So they have both increased knowledge, a clearer sense of their own, own values, and a more accurate um, 
risk perception. These are all things that we're after when we're making decisions with our patients. You know, why be afraid of that? We really, we really want this in our patients. So let's talk a little bit more about elective joint replacement because it's felt that this surgery is an ideal target for shared decision-making. In 2015, um, more than a million uh, total knee replacements were done in the United States, and that was a, a double, double the, uh, compared to the past decade. Medicare cares a lot, CMS cares a lot about this because it's the single largest payer for these procedures. And African-Americans are more physically impacted by pain and disability around joint replacements, but they receive fewer joint replacements. So remember what I said several slides ago about addressing health disparities? Shared decision-making around these uh, procedures, elective knee, elective hip, can help us uh, help address these both with allowing people to understand that the option is available and also to determine whether their values and preferences are aligned with joint replacement. So I wanna talk a little bit now about health policy and how policy has been, um, has entered into the fray here when we talk about shared decision-making. This is a paper that's really old, uh, but Emily um, Lee and, and Zeke Emanuel wrote this and I, I like to call this, um, up, even though it's kind of an older piece, because they, uh, if this, this was written two years after the Affordable Care Act was passed. And they reminded us in this opinion piece that section uh, 3506 of the ACA mentioned shared decision-making and, and encouraged its use. But at that time, it really had not made it into um, what we were actually doing with regard to using it with our patients. And they, they were really pushing CMS to start to uh, make, help us or make us use uh, decision aids uh, with our patients. And they said, in our view, it seems most critical to begin with the 20 most frequently performed procedures and to require decision aids. So that was many years ago, and I'm going to show you what CMS requires now. So just as with, I was thinking about this this morning, just as with the vaccine, you know, some states and governors have done carrots and some have done sticks. And actually one of the uh, provinces in Canada, I just heard on the uh, radio this morning, is actually going to tax unvaccinated folks. Um, so carrots and sticks in shared decision making. And I want to show you that the carrot and stick approach is what uh, CMS has been after. This was the first policy decision that CMS uh, came out with regarding shared decision-making. And it has to do with those patients who are eligible, those people who are eligible to have lung cancer screening with a CT. And remember what we said about a cascade of other events and procedures? This CT is one of them. So, so CMS said, well, I guess we better make sure that people have shared decision-making with the patients before they're able to order it for their patient. So this is a coverage decision. CMS says, we're not gonna pay for this test unless you engage in uh, shared decision-making first with your patient. So that's the stick approach. What about in our field? Um, I didn't put the coverage decision in here. I, this, is the, this was the front page of the Wall Street Journal and this was around left atrial occlusion devices and the headline was Medicare requires some heart patients to see a second doctor. And that was true. And here's the coverage decision. It, the new rule isn't about a second opinion, but it was to ensure that the patient's opinions and values are taken into account. And this is for the watchman. And so as you know, you all know who do this procedure, uh, you had to engage a, another clinician who was not gonna implant the device uh, to actually see the patient. Again, this is the stick where CMS, it's a coverage decision. We're not gonna pay for the procedure unless you engaged in, in this uh, process. So for those of you in electrophysiology, Dr. Buxton and all, um, the proposed decision memo for ICD 
um, came out and I'm really proud to say that the ACC partnered with HRS to change this coverage decision because the initial coverage decision for, uh, this is primary prevention ICD and for just to recap, for years and years and years, uh, primary prevention ICD was covered without shared decision-making, but in the renewed coverage decision, um, CMS said, well, you know, we should probably make them do some shared decision-making. And what they did, the initial proposal was this, the usual indications, cl class two or three heart failure, low EF, less than 35%, unadequate GDMT, et cetera, et cetera, couldn't have had recent revascularization. And in the last paragraph down here, it says a independent physician has to have seen the patient as well. They mirrored the coverage decision uh, for the Watchman device. And just, I'm, I'm sort of advertising your, what your societies do for you around uh, regulatory and advocacy because HRS and, and ACC came together to, to fight this off, to say, there's already been another uh, clinician who's seen this patient before they ever got to EP. So this is shared decision-making is good, but the EP can do it. And that was what, that's what the current coverage decision is. Um, and shared decision-making can be done with decision aids. And I'm gonna show you a couple of uh, decision aids that are available for this ICD decision. So that's the stick approach. We're not gonna pay for the procedure unless you do it. What about the carrot? The carrot, um, would be, we'll pay you if you do shared decision-making. So this is, and again, this is the Affordable Care Act and CMS back in 2016 announced pilots of two different um, SDM models. One is the shared decision-making model and one is the direct support model. So what were these two? The shared decision-making model was, um, in instituting a structured four-step SDM process into clinical practice for clinicians who are in ACOs. And by doing this model, CMS was, was hoping to engage more than 150,000 Medicare beneficiaries, and they would pay $50 for each SDM service provided by the clinicians. Is $50 enough? We don't know, because this actually never happened, but when you think about it, how much would be enough to get clinicians to do certain things? The direct decision support model was actually, uh, a, a CMS was planning to partner with up to seven organizations to support seven, uh, 700,000 Medicare beneficiaries uh, each year. So this carrot approach was, okay, it's not a coverage decision. It's just, we're gonna pay you to do this or, or increase your uh, revenue if you do it. And an implicit assumption in all of this is that well-informed patients might choose less expensive care. Well, this is kind of a complete bust and these two programs never went anywhere. Um, one reason was be, the ACOs basically did not come forward and, and want to participate. So, this, this, so there's currently not any, to my, to my knowledge, I don't work at CMS, but the CARET approach isn't really something that um, CMS seems to be focused on anymore. So I wanna focus now on some cardiovascular decisions that are in need of shared decision-making, kind of keep it into our realm and not, not be drifting into the elective surgery realm as much. And the ones I wanna talk about are aspirin and statin, primary prevention ICD, destination therapy LVADs, um, medications, and I'm going to use um, Velsartan Secubitril as an example, uh, the wearable defibrillator, and then transplantation, which is my field. Um, the Mayo Clinic under Dr. Victor Montori's uh, leadership has had a huge uh, number uh, for years focused on uh, shared decision making and has produced a lot of decision aids like the pictographs that you see here. This is a statin aspirin choice, and this is primary prevention. Um, and it shows a patient in 
you can look at the population of people with uh, the green people having no heart attack, the yellow people having a heart attack. And then if you look at on the right side, you can see that with statin and aspirin, how many fewer people may be, um, quote, saved, they use the term in this pictograph. So this is a pictograph that you can use with the patient. And that has been the model of decision aids that the Mayo Clinic has used um, for a number of years. This uh, was published in JAMA just a few years ago and also shows um, another approach to the um, statin aspirin um, discussion with your patient, uh, with number two being reviewing potential benefits and harms. And then number three, again, remember, we want to elicit patient preferences. Um, I'm not going to talk about the US Preventative Services Task Force, most recent. Uh, announcements about aspirin. That was, uh, I think, um, probably not the best uh, press around aspirin as all of the data had been um, published several years before. And it caused kind of an uproar. And I'm sure your offices were inundated with phone calls about whether or not patients with coronary disease should stop aspirin. But in any case, a pres there, there is a, a lot of preference and value uh, in the decision around uh, statin and aspirin for primary prevention. Another place that has, and a group of investigators that have focused on shared decision-making um, is the University of Colorado under um, Dan Matlock and Larry Allen's um, um, leadership. And you can go on their website and you can look up what's a decision aid and they have both ICD LVAD and, and colon cancer screening uh, decision aids. And let's just look at the, these are just, these are taken from the um, primary prevention decision aid. And you can show your patient when you're talking to the patient about getting an ICD or not getting an ICD on the path number one is you get an ICD and you may eventually to decline and die later of your disease, not sudden death, or maybe not sudden death. Compared to path two, you choose not to get an ICD. And I think this path two nicely graphically shows uh, what sudden death is. So this again is something you can use with your patients and, and this would uh, you know, cover the um, CMS requirement for shared decision-making. Uh, the Colorado ICD or uh, ICD uh, decision aid actually has a pictograph as well so that your patients can see that about, uh, it talks about infection, bleeding, and some of the risks of ICD. Um, with regard to destination therapy LVAD and shared decision-making, um, Larry Allen led a multi-center trial of decision support for patients and their caregivers who were being offered uh, this destination therapy for end-stage heart failure. This was um, funded by PCORI, the Patient-Centered Outcomes Research Institute. And those of you in advanced heart failure uh, certainly know that the decision around a destination therapy LVAD is, is a really a complex balance. There is, um, there's risk of stroke, there's risk of hemorrhage, uh, and then quality of life improvement with LVAD and versus what does a patient think about this complex ba balance? And Dr. Allen and others have, have written a lot about this, that when, when we approach a decision like this with our patients, we consider the survival uh, data, quality of life, how, how are the patient's symptoms, physical functioning gonna get better? costs and burdens, and then, but right in the middle, we, this is again, preferences and values, the outcomes are, that are relevant to an individual patient. Some patients, when faced with the choice of a destination LVAD, um, have this automatic, and, I, and again, the advanced heart failure cardiologists and clinicians know it's automatic. It's like, what, I have no choice. You're telling me that I'm not gonna do well if I don't have it, so that's automatic. Whereas others are very reflective and have more of a utilitarian view and say that they've thought about it for a long time. 
So the decide LVAD trial was to test the effectiveness of sh a shared decision support intervention for patients considering DTLVAD. And this consisted of site-based training and then implementation of decision aids. And we participated at St. Vincent. Um, you see the other um, centers that participated. These were all uh, high volume LVAD centers, P uh, centers, clinicians and, and programs, surgeons that were very uh, experienced in LVADs and in, pre and in talking to patients about them. Um, so this wasn't like no sites that were just starting a, a VAD program were included. So prior to this decision aid um, evaluation, um, it was very clear that industry was really driving all of the patient education and it was really marketing um, an assessment. Again, this is the group in Colorado. In 2014, uh, they looked at 77 LVAD educational materials and 97% discussed the benefits and only 53% mentioned any risk. 1% um, mentioned palliative care or hospice as an option, which is quite shocking actually, because um, back uh, many years ago in, in, in the uh, early days of LVAD implantation, uh, patients had to have a palliative care consult prior to um, implant. So a lot of decision-making around DTLVAD was deferred to marketing. So what happened in the DECIDE LVAD trial? Patients who used the decision aid had an increase in both knowledge. Remember we talked about that, that uh, the meta-analysis or the Cochrane analysis showed this knowledge increase and what was what is called values choice concordance increased as well. So people understood more and they made a decision that that, that was proven to be concordant with their own values. What also happened? Implants went down. This was a secondary outcome of the DECIDE LVAD study, and there was a 26% decrease in patients going on to LVADs. Now, your administrators might, if, if, they're, if they're on the, the meeting, uh, might be appalled by this, or maybe you might be appalled by this, and I do know uh, one of the centers, we still use the Decide LVAD um, decision aid in our program, but I do know that at least one of the uh, programs that was involved in this trial stopped using it over this concern. I, as a heart failure transplant cardiologist, think this is fantastic. If people, un meaning I'm fine with a decrease in volume, if patients are making a decision that is right for them. So where can you get decision aids? You can. There's a lot of places that you can um, download decision aids or go, uh, go online. You can uh, show your patients uh, where they can go online and look at these decision aids. PCORI um, is a decision aid uh, developer, and um, they also um, you know, they're available on their website. Uh, NIH Carnegie Mellon, and then the college. So I want to advertise that. CardioSmart, which is the patient-facing uh, web portal um, that the ACC has, has a whole section of decision aids, and uh, the, the landing page helps the patient understand what a decision aid is and, un, and how they uh, will be understanding their options. And then there are various decision aids. Um, there's uh, TAVR, um, there's uh, patients with atrial fibrillation and anticoagulation decisions are available on CardioSmart. And uh, this is a great one for end of life care. Um, this is um, the NHS the, um, in uh, Great Britain, the shared decision making program. And I, I encourage you to take a look at that um, when you're thinking about end of life decision making with your patients. And again, for the EPs, this was just published in CERC uh, Arrhythmia, um, really nice document by Dr. Chung and a lot of co-authors, some of whom are experts in shared decisions, some of whom are EPs, some of whom are patients. And um, it's a really nice um, review of shared decision-making in electrophysiology around the various procedures. And this is just table two uh, showing some other places uh, that you can get decision aids 
for EP related uh, care. So I, I encourage you to take some time to, to read that paper. So I wanna talk just a little bit about the fact that um, shared decision-making is moving towards including cost decisions that patients have to make as well. Uh, back when uh, Entresto, and I'm saying Entresto on purpose because it's trademark, um, came out, uh, uh, we were talking to patients about a medication that had um, improved, that improved survival, quality of life, et cetera, but it cost $12.50 a day, whereas they were able to get an allopurl generic uh, for $4 a month. So discussing out-of-pocket costs is kind of coming into the fray with regard to shared decision-making. So again, risks and benefits, we tell our patients for this, this medication. And for example, SGLT2s is the same. Some people have huge out-of-pocket costs for that. And um, we have to also engage them around cost. And the, the uh, again, this is Larry Allen doing some, and et al. doing some great work in this area, showing that patients, if they, I think they studied about 155 or so patients, some people were very definitely willing to fully pay out of pocket if needed and others were not. So this is entering into our, our shared decision making. I want to just briefly talk about the life vest. Um, and the reason I do is I, I find in my practice absolutely no shared decision making around this device. And um, I, we know what the vest trial showed. I'm not here to talk about the VEST trial. What I'm here to talk about, or the reason I'm bringing it up is I think we need a decision aid around this particular device early on. And I'm not, this was a long time ago, it's 2015, the, but the advertising around this device um, really, I think, had some strategies that involved fear mongering and trying to convince uh, physicians and clinicians that their patients needed the device. And I think this is very institution dependent, having talked to a lot of uh, EPs about it. But um, what I see is uh, patients being sent home after a diagnosis of dilated cardiomyopathy, brand new diagnosis being sent home from the hospital on a life vest. Now, I'm not saying that's a wrong thing to do. I'm saying I don't see that shared decision making has been done in the uh, several cases of patients I've seen in follow-up when they get uh, referred for advanced heart failure therapy, uh, the patient was simply told, uh, you'll die if you don't have this on. So I think we desperately need some shared decision-making around that. What about transplant? Um, we need shared decision-making around transplant in a way that we, I don't think, have yet, including bringing patients from VAD to transplant. It's a if people are stable on mechanical circulatory support, how they understand how they'll do with transplant is sometimes um, not really reflected in their the decision making process that we do when we go forward with listing. And I've I've asked the Colorado group to think of developing a decision aid around this decision. We wrote about this uh, during the early part of the pandemic. In Jack Case reports, we had a patient who refused transplant based when a donor uh, was available to him when uh, the surgeon, Dr. Salerno, called him um, because of fear of COVID. And so, um, in, in, and, and happily, he was actually just transplanted about two weeks ago. So, um, I think our field and transplant, those of you in it, I think we increasingly need decision aids to help our patients make really critical uh, decisions. Well, I couldn't give the talk about shared decision-making without putting this picture in um, of the recent xenotransplantation at the University of Maryland. The reason I included it is because the patient seemed to think, just like the LVAD patient, it was either die or do the transplant. And I, I do wonder how much shared decision-making was done around this. There's a lot of discussion online about this, uh, including what other options the patient might have had, including total artificial heart, et cetera. I'm, I don't want to get involved in that, but 
I do think I do wonder when I when it when it was first announced, I did wonder, gee, I wonder how they approach their decision making with this patient. Hopefully he'll do well. Okay, what about barriers to SDM? There's us. What are our barriers? We don't know enough about it. We literally have almost no incentive except for those sticks that we talked about. And then the EHR is always a barrier to everything, but is it going to help us? Is a decision aid going to pop up? How are we going to do it? And then these are some of my patients. Uh, these are the people we're going to be doing uh, sharing decisions with. Sometimes they might not be as interested in some of these decision aids that we're interested in. This is Margaret. Uh, she is now deceased, one of my dear favorite patients. And it, when I asked her if I could take this photo and use it in the lecture, uh, she said, please tell them my bags are packed and I'm ready to go. <laughs> so, um, but patients barriers are knowledge, literacy, and then how are they gonna get the decision aid? Is it the portal? Do they go online? What are they gonna do? Um, social determinants of health have a huge impact on um, barriers. And these are listed here as a, an excellent article um, that I refer you to from JAMA Cardiology. Last couple of slides. I tweeted this in 2019. I was appalled. My 97-year-old patient took a bus to get her mammogram. Her PCP actually told her, if you still got them, you need the test. Now, that's ridiculous. <laughs> uh, it's not evidence-based care, but no, no shared decision. So what a great example of a non-shared decision. And speaking of fear-mongering, um, this is a television advertisement for the Watchman device. Uh, I know you guys, nobody else ever watches TV, but I do. So this is dad fell again and he's bleeding because he's on, you know, DOAC or warfarin. And then in the hospital, the uh, cardiologist is talking about the left atrial occlusion device. This is, you know, not shared decision making. How can a patient having viewed this ad uh, really engage in, in true shared decision making. Um, Lisa Rosenbaum is a great writer. She's a cardiologist and she writes uh, in the New England Journal. And she wrote a really important uh, viewpoint several years ago on the paternalism preference and choosing unshared decision making. And what she addresses in this piece is patients sometimes need us to make the decision. And if we find that patients have, and I, as she says, seeing the terror of uncertainty on a patient's face, sometimes they need us to guide them. So I don't think we should go so far into shared decision-making that we're unable to help the patient make the decision. So I like this. This is the shared decision-making continuum. Remember being equal partners is often ideal. But if we see that our patients are unable to partner in that way, we have to sometimes give them more guidance uh, and not hold that guidance back. And I will uh, leave you with this last picture. No worries. When we want your opinion, we will give it to you. And I, I thank all of you and I look forward to the conversation. Thank you so much, Dr. Walsh. That was uh, excellent. Um, if you don't mind stopping your slide share, we'll just have everyone's uh, faces. And um, I would love for folks to come off mute and ask questions for Dr. Walsh, or please feel free to send them in the chat and I'm happy to read them read them off. Artie, I have a question, um, if that's okay. This is, this is Marwa um, Sabe, one of the heart failure doctors. Thank you for that amazing talk. Um, really, really interesting to hear about different <laughs> ways that we can use decision aids in, in uh, different aspects of cardiology and medicine. Um, I put in the chat there that we're actually involved in one of the stakeholders in that um, I decide for LBAD. And it was oh, it's yeah. really been, mm -hmm. yeah, it's been really interesting to watch that process. And along the way, I remember about, I've been in it for about a couple of years now, and maybe a year ago, someone mentioned like, oh, we're less patients are getting bads because of this. And they asked, what do you guys think about this? And I remember I had the same response you did, which that's great, right? Because you don't want them to not want it after they get it, right? That's the worst if someone, you know, feels that they made a bad decision. But my question for you is, you know, it's been so, you know, for 
for advanced heart failure, you know, we have, you know, we have a palliative care doxy, the patients, we have social work, we have our LVAD um, team of nurses, which have been amazing. That's how they make any of this happen, you know, the decision aid and the videos and everything. So it's a lot of resources and a lot of time. So my question for you is, you know, with all these other aspects in cardiology that you might want to involve, involve more decision making, um, shared decision making, how, what's your advice for, you know, getting all those resources in place, the infrastructure and the time also, because as you can, as you know, as an advanced heart failure doctor, you know, we can sometimes spend an entire hour with just one patient just because now it's time to talk about advanced therapies, right? And so how do we how do we implement that in a way, in a very busy, you know, practice of cardiology? Yeah, great question. Um, I'll answer a couple of things. One, uh, I remember uh, years ago talking to the uh, Board of Governors of the ACC around shared decision making, and there was just outrage about the fact that how could we possibly be doing this when we have 15 minute office visits and um, I, th I think two things. One, um, it's actually been shown that for some outpatient decision making, it does not increase SDM using a decision aid, doesn't increase the time spent with the patient. But with specifically to your question about DTLVAD, uh, we were in the decide um, trial. And so what we made a decision on is one, if we were going to run the patient's financial benefits, if we got that far down into the decision, um, that's when we had them use the decision aid. And we have uh, the video, the decide video loaded onto our hospital um, television thing so that they can, so that, and the coordinator's the one who does it in our program. So the coordinator, the pre-coordinator um, shows the patient how they can they can uh, look at that. So yes, we're all talking to the patient, answering questions, risks, benefits, but we ask if the patient, we ask the patient and the family to view that decide video. D does that answer your question? Yeah, no, and that's what we do in our program as well. I think for the bad transplant programs, because of all the resources we have and the coordinators, we do actually have the ability to do these things. I, my question was more about what about other aspects in cardiology where you're going to, you know, want to involve more decision making? Um, how are they going to, from my, from what I see, uh, you know, general cardiologists and, uh, you know, non heart failure cardiologists are, have 20 minute slots, right? And right, maybe right. not as many of the coordinator, you know, resources. And maybe I'm mistaken if somebody wants to jump in and say this, but it just seems like it's it maybe a little bit harder. Um, because like, just like you said, we can't do it in our own office the whole time, right? For heart failure either. We take that out. The decision aid, same thing. The video is watched separately. Coordinator comes in and asks them if they have questions, et cetera. But how do we implement that um, if you want to use these type of things in general cardiology, EP, et cetera? Yeah. Well, I think that is why the stick approach has worked only in, it, it's literally only when you have to do it, you're doing it. But DTL vet is such a high stakes decision. As we all know who do this, there are patients who later have buyer's remorse. We do not, that's, those are, it's very hard to care for a patient who is not transplant eligible, who's, uh, who's sad that they, you know, made that decision. So we're pretty all in on making sure that they, they do the decision aid for that decision and make sure that it's clear. But I, I will admit that it's, the coverage decisions are really what drive shared decision making. I don't think we see um, as much in other decisions if it's not required. Thank you. We have a couple of Thank questions you. from our heart failure group. Uh, one from Dr. Rashad Garan. Rashad, go ahead. Thank you so much for a, a fantastic talk. Sort of along, along those lines um, with obviously the shift in um, in allocation uh, of organs, you know, a couple of years ago, and obviously, you know, the the, the pathways to transplant looking looking you know different than they did um, prior to that shift. And I wonder how you approach um, the sort of not just the you know, for example, the destination therapy versus no destination therapy. Well, now you're comparing, you know, do we do we you know do we use an LVAD? versus a transplant for, you know, a transplant eligible patient. 
in a potentially, you know, somebody who's acutely hospitalized? And how do you sort of work in that complexity in somebody who, um, you know, isn't isn't sitting in the office and 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 sort of is is faced with some of these decisions in a in a slightly more um, compromised state? Yeah, great, great question. Um, those of you not in the transplant field, we've we've shifted hard towards supporting patients with temporary devices um, in order to get them listed and transplanted. Um, if you're um, if you have a, an LVAD in and you're listed for transplant, you're uh, status four, and many of those patients are um, uh, waiting now years for a transplant. And there's actually a really nice patient, a patient with an LVAD wrote a letter to the editor uh, in um, Jack Hard Failure saying, uh, "I'm I'm out here waiting, and I, you know it's over for me. I'm never going to get a transplant." It's it's a it's a really nice letter. I'm not sure we're doing any shared decision making around helping patients get to transplant. We're we're I, I do think we're mostly telling them because we're sharing them the with them the information around the 2018 decision and saying with an LVAD, um, you know, you'd wait for a long time. And that, I mean, as you know, that puts you in the ICU for all of these many whatever <laughs> weeks, months, and uh I, I don't, we're not using decision aids. We don't have the data to, to do that yet. Um, but I, I think most programs are doing exactly the same thing. Thank you. We have one more question from another one of our heart failure docs, Dr. Jennifer Ho, uh, who says, wonderful talk. Wondering if there are any data on whether using different shared decision-making tools may influence the decision made. So um, can we cross compare? Uh, that's a that's a great question. I'm unaware of any studies about comparing, but there is um, a process of review of decision aids to make sure that they're um, appropriate. You can't just start making a decision aid yourself, like decide you're going to you know be a source for that without um, being um, the, the word accredited is wrong, but it, you have to you have to have, be certified. So, but no, I I've not seen any literature looking at like pictographs versus, you know, videos. Good, really good question. Thank you. We have about a minute left. Uh, any other final questions for Dr. Walsh? Well, thank you very much, Dr. Walsh, for joining us. I think we all learned a lot from uh, from your talk. Um, and uh, following this session, after a short break at 9.15, um, Dr. Walsh will kindly join us for a women's uh, career development uh, session as well. So look forward to um, many of you joining us there. Um, for everyone else, uh, we will uh, see you again next week for Grand Rounds on Friday. Um, thanks, everyone. Thanks for having me. I really enjoyed it. I hope to meet you all soon. <laughs> We hope so too.